Having watched the rehearsal, now the boom operator has to determine the best way with which to capture the scene. Now, it doesn't just mean the production dialogue, even though that is the primary focus of you as a boom operator on that set. But you also have other sounds too, like let's say there's a basketball game going on not just in the foreground where your actors are, but there's one deeper as well. If you don't provide an isolated track of that, Post is going to have to guess how that is, and they're going to have to manually match up every single dribble. If you give them an isolated track of that though, like for example, you put a microphone closer to that game, and since we see it, you got to hear it, then chances are Post is going to love you for that because they can play that level in whenever they are on, on camera. So if the, if the camera is panning and sometimes they see them, sometimes they don't, they don't need to have it as more prominent in the track if it's not going to be in the shot at that time. So for example, someone walks from stage right to stage left, and if that's the case, then, and the camera's tracking with them, they might want to bring down that basketball level a little bit over the dialogue if you don't see it in the background, especially if there's if they're cutting back and forth between coverage shots and that kind of thing. And especially, especially, especially if on the turnaround, they did not have those guys in the background playing the game because they were going to be out of the shot. And they said, no, we're not going to have them play there because they're not in the shot. It could be one of those things that comes in handy having that track for adding it back in there to post. Now, the same kind of thing would happen inside if you're doing a uh, like a church carnival type scene and there's a little pea shooter type gun going on and knocking down the cans and it's in the shot and it's got to be, you know, something they pick up. You want to provide post with, an, uh, with a track of that. They're going to love you for it. It's not just as simple as recording production audio even, uh, dialogue, even though that is the main focus of what you're doing there. If you could provide those extra tracks, anything that is making noise in your shot, Post is going to love you. Now, how do you determine which microphone is going to best be used for what? Well, it all starts with knowing which microphones your sound mixer has. If the sound mixer, for example, only has one super cardioid microphone and one shotgun microphone, that is obviously their preference. You may have others that you can bring in there and say, well, what can I also bring this one? Mixer may listen to it and say, I don't like it. That's their prerogative. What the sound mixer likes is what they're going to put in their tracks. And if they don't like the way something sounds, they're not going to let you use it. And they're the department head. Therefore, they are always right, even when they're not. But <laughs> you didn't hear me say that. So you have a selection that is finite. The sound mixer provides you with their, their sound package and you choose the mics accordingly. Now, let's just say <clears throat> you happen to have an infinite selection of microphones. What is going to be ideal for the human voice? You have heard, I'm sure, of large diaphragm condensers and large diaphragm uh, or a small diaphragm condensers and maybe large diaphragm dynamics, small diaphragm uh, dynamics. Well, the big thing to keep in mind here is that a condenser microphone is where you want to be. You don't want to use a dynamic microphone because as soon as you get a little bit farther away than is comfortable, it's going to fall off. The dialogue is just going to fall off completely. It's going to sound like you're at the other side of the room. Do not use a dynamic microphone for production dialogue. Now, there are circumstances you could use them, but I'll get into that in a bit. When are you going to use a large diaphragm versus a small diaphragm? Well, chances are you're not ever going to. You could argue that if you set up a wildline booth or something, you might do that. Chances are even then you're probably going to want to use the microphone that you recorded the scene with. Unless, of course, you're doing like a voiceover or there's doing, they're doing a singing scene for a singing television show or a movie. In that circumstance, then probably go for a large diaphragm simply because that's more of what, the, what they use in a studio. Now, the difference in, in between a, a studio, uh, a large diaphragm condenser, for example, and a small diaphragm condenser is basically, as a general rule, if it's one uh, uh, one inch in diameter or bigger, it's considered a large diaphragm, even though, you know, technically it doesn't exactly dial in on exactly one inch. I mean, it could be considered a large diaphragm, even if it's slightly smaller, as opposed to, you know, I mean, like slightly, I'm not saying like, oh, well, that's a large diaphragm. No, it's obviously not at that point. But the difference in those, and, and, and there's, there's many differences, but in the simplest possible terms of, of, of the way to think about them, a large diaphragm is a bigger surface area. So if you have a bigger surface area like this, for example, on a large diaphragm, and you have a small diaphragm condenser like this, we've discussed in the past that your voice is basically just creating vibration in the air. Which one is going to pick up vibration better, a larger surface or a smaller surface? Well, your vibrations in the air are going to be picked up better by a large diaphragm because there's more of a surface to actually move. 
That said, it's going to be more sensitive than a smaller diaphragm. However, at the same time, you know, you can you can easily say, well, that's better. It's better. It's lower self noise, and it picks up and creates a higher output. Not necessarily, because a small diaphragm condenser actually picks up the lows and high, I'm sorry, the lows and highs more evenly than a, a large diaphragm does. Because a large diaphragm, because of the added ma mass of the uh, the actual capsule itself of, of the diaphragm itself. The extra mass resonates at a lower frequency, so it picks up the lows better than the highs. A smaller diaphragm condenser actually picks up a balanced, uh, a better balance of the lows and highs. So it's usually the smaller diaphragm condensers is what we use in the world of film for picking up good, clean audio on set, especially because we can't get the microphone right in their face. I mean, if we could get a microphone always right here, like always, even in the wide shots, it may be different. But you still wouldn't want to, want, want to boom with a large diaphragm. It's too heavy. All right, so enough about that. How do you choose which microphone to use and when, though? What patterns? Well, you could easily go with a cardioid and say, oh, well, a cardioid is going to make sense, right? Not necessarily. A cardioid does not re have as much reach as a super or a hyper cardioid pattern does. And if you have a microphone, um, that has to be about a foot over the actor's head because you're doing a wide and a tight at the same time. You need to have that extra reach. A cardioid is going to fall, fall off a, and make them sound a little more distant than a super cardioid would. A super cardioid is going to give you more reach, but the rejection is different. So if, for example, you have a scene where there is, a, let's, let's say you're shooting inside of a, of a house and the roof is tin. All that little, all those little raindrops are hitting the tin roof, and it's going to be really overwhelmingly loud. If that's the case, you might opt to have a cardioid pattern microphone if that is an option to you. And the reason is because if you have the null point of that microphone pointed straight up at your loudest possible noise source, you're going to get the very best signal to noise ratio. If you use a super cardioid pattern, it has a little bit of a rear lobe. So if the microphone is pointed straight down like this, it's going to have a, lobe, a little small lobe of sensitivity pointed straight up as well. So it could actually be louder above your noise floor, and it's not going to be as good of a signal noise ratio. Now, obviously, this holds true for the most part, but at the same time, you know, if you can't get that microphone really close to your actor and you may need to dig out that voice a little bit better because you still have to hold, you know, a foot over their headroom, then you may reach for that super cardioid or hyper cardioid pattern microphone just because it gives you the added reach. The worst possible noise source in the room is what you want to reject out. And chances are you know the null part of your microphone. So a super cardioid pattern microphone is probably going to have a null part, like if the microphone's point straight up in the air, the null parts of those um, uh, super cardioid pattern microphone is going to be in the rear section, about 125 to 135 degrees off axis as a general rule. On a cardioid pattern microphone, it is more of a cardioid heart. So it's a heart-shaped pattern, and of course the null part is straight off the rear lobe. So keep that in mind as well. However, Let's say you are doing a scene where there's like four or five people talking and they're all in a huddle. A super cardioid pattern microphone may be good to pick that up from a higher distance. However, if, they, if there's a separation of people, let's say they're four feet apart, you may opt to have a cardioid type uh, pattern microphone just because it's going to better pick up that whole big reach. Uh, the, uh, the the spread of people. So a person is, let's say, all the way over here, a person's over here. That's not much of a spread if you have to keep over, over a foot of headroom. You can either easily gently cue the microphone back and forth and pick up whoever's talking. However, if they're farther apart, like maybe four feet apart, then in that case, you may opt to use a cardioid pattern microphone if it's available because of the wide pit, wider pickup pattern, especially if there are overlaps. If there's a lot of overlaps because it's a it's a comedy and the director says, oh, let it go. I love the organic, whatever. You know, they love directors love using the word organic. So if that's the case, you may have to use a wider pattern microphone in order to pick it all up. And so keep that in mind. What is the microphone pattern good for? Now, chan chances are you've you've heard all, what pattern the microphone actually is, but listening to the microphone is going to tell you what's going to be best at. Don't just point the microphone at yourself. Point it and and continue to talk into it while listening, and listen to where that starts to reject, where, where the off-axis rejection is. How much is it attenuating? Is it like, do you sound like you drop off really, really abruptly and quickly, or is it more gradual as you go around? That's also something important to know as well. So. 
chances are that's giving you enough to at least think about indoor micro, uh, which indoor microphones you're going to use. However, there are sometimes you're going to want to use a shotgun microphone inside. But keep in mind, a shotgun microphone listens kind of in a cone shape. And of course, a short shotgun is going to be a little bit of a wider cone versus a full size shotgun that's going to be, you know, a lot longer and it's going to be a narrower pattern. So you have to have a boom operator that's more spot on and really nails that axis in order to really drive out the rich, richness in their voice. Because if you're slightly off axis, because, you know, you have a pole out 15 feet, their depth perception is not that good. And suddenly they fall way off, you know, uh, you know, because you've missed their axis, you're, you're they're not not on access with them anymore. Well, that's not going to do anybody any good. So you want to choose the microphone pattern that is going to be best for it. Now, if you need extra reach, that's when you're going to reach for one of those shotguns. But remember that pattern, the cone shape pattern. If there is a hard surface, my, uh, the sounds are going to be reflecting off of that. Now, here's the way sound waves work. If, if you listen to a sound with your ear right on that wall, like if you could recess your head into the wall and listen, then the, the sound is just going into your ear and hitting your ear. But if you are pointing your other ear at the wall, when it hits off of the wall and reflects back, it's actually more dissipated. When that, that dissipated sound is not going to be nearly as sharp and crisp, it's going to sound more like the wall or the surface that you're playing it off of. A shotgun microphone doesn't just hear in that direction and stop at the wall. It hears the reflection of that wall as well. Same thing happens if someone's sitting at a table. If someone's sitting at a desk, for example, in a, in a school, and you use a shotgun microphone to catch them, you got to be very careful about not getting a lot of that reflection off of the table or at a conference room, same kind of thing. You may have to give it three or four feet of air over top, but you do not want to cue that microphone straight up and down because chances are you're going to catch a lot of the reflection off of that table. And the timing difference between the actor's voice here in their mouth and their the the table that's a foot and a half below them and back up so you know it's not just hearing your voice here it's hearing the reflection it's going to maybe be out of phase and it could start to negatively pull on your sound so a shotgun microphone is not going to be as good in that circumstance even if you need the extra added range unless of course you could put down something on the table which to kind of you know sop it up a little bit to to absorb some of that sound reflection Keep in, keep in mind the acoustics and what a pattern of a microphone is good for. Now, you could argue that the pattern of the microphone is simply a name given to it to give you an idea of what the thing sounds like. And that's true. However, when people label a microphone as a certain thing, chances are that's what they want you to know it as. Even though it may not sound exactly like a hypercardioid or exactly like a supercardioid or exactly like a like a, a cardioid pattern microphone, you need to listen to it and know how that microphone sounds, not only on axis, but off axis as well. The coloration of that microphone is most likely going to only be affecting what is in the front lobe of that microphone. As soon as you get off axis too far, you're going to be starting to it's not going to focus as well. You start to lose highs because highs are more directional than the lows are. So the really higher uh, pitch sounds are going to start dissipating and falling off more as the microphone pattern starts to get wider and wider. It's only going to be picking up the lower sounds as you get really, really at the edge of, of the uh, pattern. And this represents on the frequency response chart. But it's not enough to just look at that chart and say, oh, well, this is how it, how it is. You have to know the way a microphone sounds. And microphones, I hate to tell you this, are not all equal. Even the microphones that are engineered to be exactly a certain way, they are not exactly the pattern they say they are. Just because the machinery that makes them are going to manufacture the components could be that it has a, a, a fifth of, of a millivolt. It could be five millivolts more or less, and that could affect the way the, the, the microphone pattern picks up. It could be that, that there is a slight little bitty dimple or a bump or something like that that happens pretty early in the microphone's career, and that could change the way that microphone sounds. You need to know this stuff. Even, even just the microphone itself, just through the manufacturing process, it's not going to be following the exact frequency response that's laid out on the chart. It's not going to be perfect. It's going to actually vary quite a bit. And you may say, well, what do you mean? Like maybe one little bit, it might be like 10 megahertz earlier on the cut, maybe. It could also be that it adds two decibels in a place it didn't necessarily wasn't supposed to, or it might cut two decibels in a place it wasn't engineered to. Because the frequency response chart will dictate what it was engineered for that's different than what it was actually produced to be. 
So keep that in mind. You want to actually know the way your mixers microphones sound. Mixers I've worked with, I can listen to one microphone and say, oh, I don't want this one. I want the other one because I'm, I will be more familiar with it. I like the way it sounds more. It may, it may be a newer microphone. It may pick up better, or it may be an old, more old school and they change the internal components on the newer version of that microphone. And it may not sound as good to me. Believe it or not, this is a thing. And if you're a microphone expert, like a boom operator is supposed to be, a boom microphone um, uh, operator, a boom operator is basically a microphone placement technician. So your job is basically to know the way that microphones work, know which microphone is supposed to go where. For dialogue, that's basically it, what I just got through saying. Now, that's not to say that that's only, those are the only patterns that we ever deal with. If, for example, you're recording gunshots, you would probably want to have some sort of a, a microphone that's an omnidirectional pattern. Now, you could go the dynamic route because chances are on a dynamic uh, pressure operated microphone, it is going to be better for picking up louder SPL without damaging the microphone. And that's true. However, it's not going to get the fall off as well. So if you go, that microphone is not going to pick up all the, the, the sounds that are falling away as, as that gunshot is shot into the distance. It's going to go and die really quickly. A condenser microphone, though, is more prone to damage. So you might want to split the difference there and you might want to get a dynamic microphone for closer and a condenser microphone farther away or just do something better and get yourself a condenser microphone that can handle a higher SPL, put that closer and you're going to be a lot happier. I won't tell you in this video which microphones I use uh, in those that I prefer to use and that I'll bring with me to, to uh, allow a mixer to, to, you know, since I basically plant microphones, if I'm recording a gunshot, for example, a mixer doesn't really care what I have because most of the time they're not concerned with that. They'll give me a track for it if I want to. And I have certain microphones I, I prefer to use for that. And I do have dynamics and condensers. However, I digress. If you are doing <clears throat> something else that involves maybe tap dancing, or it involves maybe uh, some sort of a sound that uh, you need to pick up that's more of a specialty type thing. Uh, like, like, uh, like I did a movie a few years ago that where people were stomping, where st uh, it was a stomp movie. And if you do, you pick up the, you want to pick up feet and something like that, you might want to bring out a boundary layer microphone and stick it on that because it's going to pick up every single impact or an impact microphone, even believe it or not, a hydrophone, depending on the kind of hydrophone you get, if it's a, a hydrophone, uh, contact microphone, putting that on a. Uh, on a wooden surface like a, a stage could also pick up those tap, tap sounds really well. <clears throat> so, I mean, it really depends on what you're trying to capture. If you're inside of a car, you obviously need to have something small enough to be hidden inside the car. However, you want to have the reach to pick up the voices correctly. And because of the internal acoustics of the car, you may have some issues that you have to overcome regarding the way that things sound in there. If it is, for example, if you use a full-size supercardioid microphone, you could pick up too, too much of the reflection of that person's voice inside the car. It could be overwhelming. And therefore, if you use something smaller like a short shotgun microphone like the DPA 40 uh, 4098, that right there could be enough to get the fidelity of the voice really crisply and, and, and really strongly without getting a lot of that reflection. And if they have the windows down, you may be rejecting out some of the outdoor so uh, sounds as well that are coming in through the window. Now, keeping in mind also, you may want to use the same kind of microphone to pick up both people in the front seat, in which case you might want to have a wider cardioid pattern microphone, or you might want to have something more of an omnidirectional, like a BLM uh, microphone, and you stick that straight up in the, on the ceiling as well. And it basically makes a um, uh, omnidirectional globe and picks up everything in the front there. Petering Omnigus also is an option there, depending on what you want to do. Now, it's all going to determine on your mixture and their style. They may say, just always use the Cub 1 inside the car. And you're like, okay, I'll use that. If they say, I want the largest diaphragm that you can get in there, I want to, I want to see, uh, um, I want to see my, uh, my, my MKH series Sennheisers inside the car if you can. If you can't, then we'll go smaller if you need to. He may have or she may have certain microphone preferences that they like to use. And you gotta, uh, you got to you know, use that in your designing of the scene. But you want to keep in mind all these little factors, for example, head turns. If you're not lob micing everybody, for example, and somebody goes from looking out the window this way, 
you have to be on axis with them that way. And then if they turn back to the driver and they talk to them this way, you can't have the microphone on this side. Otherwise, it's going to be off axis here and on axis there. It's going to sound really weird. Having the microphone right up in front of them may be the ideal spot, but because of the shot, it may be too wide. It may, may not be an option. You might need to come underneath with a, a microphone with more reach. And if that's the case, then you might have fun trying to plant the thing if you see everything from, you know, the sunroof all the way down to their, the bottom of their legs. But you have to take that into consideration when you are actually designing the scene from a microphone point of view. But knowing the way that your, your microphones sound, and when I say your microphones, I mean your mixer's microphones, the way that those sound, what they are good for, what they are not, not as good for, what is their reach, what is their rejection, all of these and more are very critical for you to know as a boom operator. Because if you know how the microphone sounds and where it's ideal and what that pattern is good for, what the microphone itself is good for, and you know what it's going to excel at, you're going to be able to best determine which microphones and which uh, which microphones are going to be used to pick up which sound. And that's extremely critical from a boom operator's sound planning perspective. Have a question you'd like answered or want to add something? Be sure to write it in the comment section down below. You can also make a suggestion for future topics of discussion. Again, comment section down below or you can email me at soundspeeds at yahoo.com. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss out on future sound advice.